Welcome to Scanner School. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and this podcast is always here to teach you everything that you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. All notes from today's podcast can be found on our website at scannerschool.com slash session 107. Now, I remind you, if you're listening to this podcast live, which I mean it is Tuesday, to January 7th, 2020. Again, first podcast of the new year, so happy new year, everyone. We will be live tonight on Facebook and YouTube to do a live Q&A session. So join us tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. For those of you who like to live in Zulu or GMT time, that would be 1 a.m. Wednesday morning. And you can find us at scannerschool.com slash live over on our YouTube channel, scannerschool.com slash YouTube, or over on Facebook, scannerschool.com slash Facebook. Hope to see you there. And uh, again, if you're catching this after our published date, hope to catch you all next month. All right, let's jump right into this week's Q&A session with Ask Scanner School, Volume 16. Welcome to The Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. Okay, welcome to the very first podcast of 2020. Again, Happy New Year, everyone. Hopefully your Christmas, your Hanukkah, your Boxing Day, New Year's were all healthy and happy. You got to spend time with family, and maybe you got a new radio toy that you have been looking for. I know over here in my house, we've been battling a little bit of a stomach bug, so it's been a little bit of a rough couple of a week or so over here. I'm recording this podcast before the end of 2019, so it's a little bit ahead of time, and hopefully by the time we go live with this, We'll all be feeling much, much better. But the three of us here in my house, plus my iguana, for those of you who remember the earlier Ask Scan School video sessions where the iguana was sitting right behind me, yeah, even she's feeling under the weather as well. So it's been uh, a very interesting Christmas and New Year's here at my location. So again, all of the questions come in from the Ask page. If you haven't been to our website yet, you can go to scannerschool.com slash ask where you can ask me a question. It's a great opportunity for you to reach out and Ask me a direct question. If you ask me via SpeakPipe or using our local 516 number, which again is 516-308-2885, your question will not only be bumped up to the top of the list, but you'll also be in the running for a free tutoring call. Now, this free tutoring call is something that I offer to those who are looking for something special as a one-on-one session. Now, again, normally I charge $47 for this consulting call or this tutoring call, and it's a great way to be virtually side-by-side and ask and answer questions. So we'll use uh, Skype or Zoom where we can screen share. We can see what's going on on each other's computers. I can guide you through everything. And nine times out of 10, depending on what platform you're using, you'll also get a recording of the consulting call as well. So you'll have something to take with you in order to reference at a later date and time. So again, if you want to ask me a question for uh, a future podcast, you go to scannerschool.com slash ask. And if you'd like to book me right now for a consulting call, scannerschool.com slash consulting. Let's go ahead and jump right into our first email question. All right, our first question comes in from Robert Sedak. I hope I'm saying his last name correctly. Rob has uh, previously asked a question when I actually offered him a free tutoring session. So I'm glad to see that Rob does have a follow-up question to what we spoke with. Basically, his question is, he's got the GPS function on the SDS-100. He wants to know how does the GPS function know what channels you want to listen to and also what GPS do I recommend? So I guess um, this one is kind of a, a, an interesting question. It keeps coming up. So I know this is a pain point for a lot of you and it's really reinforcing the fact that I need to get my, my rear quarters in gear and get another training session or another course going here. You know, I've been kind of sluggish to get my SDR training up and running and out out the gate. After that one, I'm definitely looking at doing an SDS 100, SDS 200 training because there's a lot of questions about these radios. And um, I've been collecting them all and I'm working on a way to outline them. And and GPS is one of them. So let's go back and, and look at the GPS question first, because which hardware do I recommend? Now, Uniden just came out with a new piece of hardware. It's called the BC SGPS. That's BC SGPS. Now I want to put a link to this in the session notes. I'm also going to create a web page for this too at scannerschool.com slash BC SGPS. Now I can ask Bravo, Charlie, Sierra, Golf, Papa, Sierra. And it'll be a link to 
a couple of affiliates that I have set up so you can go ahead and purchase this new piece of gear. You're sitting about the $79, $89, dollars range, depending where you buy it from. And it's a universal GPS that Uniden now comes out with or came out with. And it's interesting because now it allows you, it's a whole kit, and it allows you not only to plug into the older Uniden systems like the BCT-15, the 15X, the, the 996s, the 346s, the 325s. It also plugs into their 885 CB radio, the SDS-100, and the SDS-200. It's an all-inclusive kit. Now, the only thing you have to watch out for with this kit is that the board rate on it is 9600 board, whereas the scanners kind of default to 4800 board. Now, Previously, I actually purchased and set up the older style setup, which is actually called the Uniden BC GPSK. And the GPSK was really just a puck, and it was a a cigarette lighter adapter, and then a DB9 connector that went to a, a DIN connector, so that would allow you to kind of plug it into the back of the radio. Now, if you want to use the GPSK with a radio such as the SDS100 that has a a different connector on it than the typical proprietary data connection that the uh, the handhelds have. You had to buy another piece of gear that went along with that. So now again, if you wanted to use a GPSK with the radios such as the BCD three twenty five P two or even the SDS one hundred, you had to go ahead and buy the BC UTGC, which is a GPS USB cable that allowed you to take the DIN connector from the GPS, and then you plug that into a USB connector, and the USB connector would also plug into your cigarette lighter adapter so that you could not only power up the scanner, but also the GPS. And it was another $25 on top of the $80 you already spent on the GPSK. So the new one, the the brand new BC SGPS, basically is all in one. And it's even killing me, too, because I just bought the GPS connected to for my SDS-200. And, of course, this universal kit would have worked on that as well, saving me a little bit of money. So, again, if you're changing radios out a lot in your vehicle or if you're playing around a lot of uh, different types of radios and you have one stationary GPS set up or you have one in your vehicle, it may be worthwhile. I mean, if you haven't made the investment yet to kind of go ahead and get go for that GPS setup. So I, I don't have any experience right now with the brand new BCS GPS. It's um, not something I've purchased yet, but I will be buying that, especially when I go ahead and make the training courses. I'm going to go ahead and, and put both GPSs side by side, show you how to hook both of them up and everything else as well. So again, if you want to know when the new training course will be available, probably sometime in the second half or close to the halfway point of 2020, you can just sign up for our mailing list at scannerschool.com right there on the front page. That's really the best thing to do in order to uh, understand that. So also the first part basically of Bob's question is, how does a GPS function know what channels you want to listen to? So the GPS doesn't really know what channels it is that they are that you want to listen to, okay? It's not that smart. What the GPS really does is it's a filter. And it's filtering out everything that's outside of two different radiuses or radii, I guess is what it would be. And what happens is when you set up your SDS 100 or any type of home patrol type of scanner is you're either going to put your zip code in or you're going to use your GPS to figure out where your central point is. From there, you're going to set up your, your radius, right? This is how far out from that center point you would like this bubble to be that you want to listen to. All right. Now let's, let's, let's call it a bubble. Okay. Now you also have other transmitters that are around you that are outside of this bubble. Okay. So let's just say, for example, here, you've set your bubble for 10 miles. Maybe you have a transmitter that's 15 miles away, but that transmitter also has a bubble of 10 miles. Well, guess what? Five miles away from you or five miles inside of that bubble is where that bubble is going to come into. According to your scanner, you want to listen to that. That's how it works. So it's no longer a, this town is 10 miles away, I no longer want to listen to it type of situation when it comes to programming a scanner. It's the overlap of not only your position or position A and the position B of the transmitter. When those two touch, that's the filter of when the GPS turns off and on, or the scanner turns off and on, what it is you are going to hear, 
Okay. So what I recommend is lowering that level down until you get it to just about what it is you want to hear. Now, the best way to figure this all out is when you go into the radio reference database, you can actually click on the call signs when you look at the database and it'll show you the radius of that transmitter. Now, this goes not only in conventional mode, but also in the trunking systems as well, right? Each site should have its own geofence or a geo coordinate as well as part of the radio reference database at this point. Sometimes it is just a straight circle. Other times it can be a polygon as well. Although I haven't really seen any polygons, but I have the feeling that if it isn't out there now, it will definitely be there uh, in the short term. I really think it's out there now, to be honest with you, though, because I remember seeing uh, quite a bit of discussion about polygons in the radio reference database. So again, that's one part of the filter. The other part of the filter is your service types. So that's, again, how the GPS air quotes here knows what it is that you want to listen to. So you're going to turn on, say, fire, tack, fire, dispatch. Unless fire attack and fire dispatch are the frequencies that are being received, they're not going to basically come through the scanner. I, I've told the story before uh, when I first started getting involved with the SDS type of programming when I had my 436 HP, and I was trying to program in my local utility company, right, a Long Island Power Authority at the time, which is now PSE and GLI, and. What was happening was I would set it up and I put it into a bank, I put it in the favorites list, put it in a favorites key, a quick key, whatever it is you want to call it. And I would toggle just that bank, just turn that bank on, and the scanner would say nothing to scan. And I went back and forth thousands of times through Sentinel, wasted about an hour and a half, and I realized that I didn't have in my service types utilities turned on. I turned on utilities and Presto Changeo, I was able to listen to at the time LIPA, which is now PSCG, LI, and I can now listen to the electric company as well as the gas company going through the area and repairing the lines. Now, the whole point of me doing that was so when it hits the fan, when the when uh, you know the pudding hits the fan and it goes all over the place and you want to know what's going on with repairs in your neighborhood, I was I already had a bank set up for it and I went through the, the exercise of trying to find that one out. So again, it is... The your center point plus the distance away from the center transmitter, when those two they touch or overlap, that is what's going to enable the filter as to what is going to then be received by the scanner as long as the service type is also enabled for that frequency. All right. I understand it is a little bit confusing on this. And again, I plan on laying this all out in a brand new course that I'm going to be working on. Again, right as my SDS training course is complete, I'll begin working on the SDS 100 and SDS 200, which will go through every nook and cranny of these radios. And it's overwhelming on my part just to think about how much there is to have to teach about these radios. They are monsters. And it's it's going to be a big course to create. I'm going to tell you that right now. So I got my work cut out for you, but I'm, I'm in it for you guys. And hopefully it does answer a lot of questions. So if you do have questions about the SDS and 100 and 200, please continue to submit those because it's just going to help me build a better course for you guys. Thank you, Bob, so much for your question. I really hope that did answer it for you. Okay, our next question comes in from Christopher McCarter. He writes, I have four open carriers which are audible on a Whistler WS1040. They are, and he gives a whole bunch between 780 and 782. So he goes, why are they showing up in FM mode? What is the exact source is attached as a JPEG? All right, so he attaches a picture of a four-port USB hub. So he goes, why? My question is, why would it generate noise at those frequencies? I've tried Google, the various ICs and chips and circuits, and Google has no clue. This thing was made back in 208-ish. It has four USB plugs, one crystal for 12 megahertz, an LED power indicator. What is inside of these that would run in a frequency range within 3.125 steps? All the frequencies are open at the same time. It does not trunk. The interference goes out even as far as seven feet. Inquiring minds want to know. Great. Great question. And let me tell you, as somebody who works in RF, and this used to be something I would go out there and actually hunt down as a part as my job at AT AT&T. So for those of you who don't know, I now work in RF design, 
with AT&T out of here at Loyal, New York. My job is basically to design and kind of plumb out cell sites. So from the, the basically from the ground to the antennas, the, the plumbing, the radios, the antenna models, everything that's being built is my job. Previous to that, I was part of optimization where we would actually configure the cell sites and optimize them and, and go out there and not only make them all work well together and play nice in the giant sandbox that is RF, but also when you would get uplink interference that would cause an issue, we would have to not only find that there was an interference there, but in the very earlier days of that, we didn't have a crew that was dedicated to doing that. We would have to try and go out there and try and sniff it out ourselves. I mean, this is the infancy of LTE. And what we'd end up finding is, is, is quite a bit of things out there cause noise in the RF environment that you would never think that would cause noise in the RF environment. So it would be things as simple as compact fluorescent light bulbs. You would have lottery terminals. Uh, bad connectors on antennas were, were a huge culprit where somebody just didn't tighten it down hard enough. You would have stuff like copy machine power supplies was a, was a big one for, for some reason. Of course, bidirectional amplifiers, those, those were a major, major pain in our necks for a while as well. And uh, you know even, even stuff in the home that, that just went bad, you, you just have bad hardware, a USB power supply or USB only switching transformers. And even like you have here a USB hub, again, coming out seven feet probably wouldn't interfere too badly with a cell site, but it is wreaking havoc on your, your scanner setup. Now, more closer to home, I've had the same issue on low band on 46 megahertz with my cheap Chinese switching power supplies that came with switches and routers. And I've had to go through there and, and clean a lot of those up as well, which is another re reason why I do like using my Astron 12 l power supplies and get rid of all the all the, the junky power supplies that are out there that get shipped with, uh, with new electronics. So, you know, they, they, they create noise. And the, really the best way to figure this thing out is it's nothing wrong that you're doing. It's just things oscillate and, you know, they do transmit and it's it's kind of a byproduct sometimes. Now, again, you know, the best thing to do here is, is to quit using that product and find something else that's out there. I mean, if, if, if somebody comes, like if, if, if we were knocking a door from AT&T, we would ask you to stop it. And if you didn't stop it, we'd follow with the FCC because, you know, you're interfering with our spectrum. At 780, you now realize that you're interfering with somebody else's spectrum. So, again, you're going out a couple of feet. Mm. And again, too, you never would have, you never, this is the problem. You never would realize that you were doing this if you weren't in the scanner radio hobby, which is one of those baffling things. There's no way to know this is actually going on. Crazy to think, isn't it? So, with that, you can try wrapping it. I mean, the tinfoil hat, right? You can insulate it. Is that good for the USB hub? Mm. I don't know how much heat it generates. But again, you could try something newer that's out there, but you're probably always going to find something that's got a little bit of noise behind it as well. So they just happen, all right? And and again, it is what it is. I know you followed with a question saying you found a whole bunch of other on low band with PL tones and all that. It's, it's, you may drive yourself nuts, but for anybody who's interested and does have this problem in your home, here's a really good way to, to try and isolate it. First of all, you can walk around with a handheld antenna in a handheld scanner and try and see where what area of the house it is the strongest in. Now, you might need to turn on the, att uh, the attenuator on your scanner. You might even need to just take the antenna off as you get closer to it and walk around the house. You know, go around the walls, go around anything that's plugged in, go around all the electronics and see. Is it even a time of the day that's causing the issue with you? It could be something, you know, it's outside. It could be something that's on a timer. It could be an outdoor light. It could be something weather related too. It could be that as things get full of water, they they insulate and they don't insulate. You just don't know. And again, we've even found here too on 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 HF, it could be problems with the commercial power as well, uh, the commercial utility lines where the installations aren't right on there as well. And again, you can call the local power utility, and they actually have a team that comes out there and want they want to know about it too because it's not the most effective way for them to uh, to to deliver their service to you if they're actually causing RF as well. So. 
Again, there's a lot of stuff out there that will cause interference on it. And again, it's part of the hobby. This is this is the cool thing about scanning. It's not just listening to PD and FD and EMS. And I mean, this is what it is that I'm I'm trying to you know. It's more out there than just just listening to a small thing, right? There's there's RF all over the place, and come outside the box a little bit and and learn what else is out there. And you'll open up a whole new Pandora's box when it comes to scanning, which is really really cool. So Christopher, I want to say congratulations on on tripping up on something that is going to basically be a a hunt on your part. In the amateur radio market or the amateur radio world, we call that fox hunting. We actually do something like this intentionally where you send somebody out undercover basically to to transmit and and you try and find him. That maybe if you want to hone your skills, you could talk to a local amateur radio club and see if they actually have fox hunting set up. And and um, you know, I, I know here there's a fox hunting club that just does that, and they go out once a month, and and it's a real good time for the, by those who actually go out there and do it. I haven't done it in years and years and years, but I've I've heard of a lot of stories where you know they'll throw a radio up in a tree, or somebody will actually be dressed up and they'll they'll put it in a baby carriage and those kinds of things. So really really wild people out there. But uh, great question, thanks a lot, and thanks for reminding me. To that you know stuff is out there that causes uh, interference and it is quite a bit of a headache when when you when you have it so again thanks a lot for your question and uh, we'll go on to the next one okay so Frank Nichols senior he writes in thank you so much for accepting me I'm a 66 year old and I'm an amateur radio operator my call sign is kd 0 feb and I also love listening to the scanner I just got a secondhand Radio Shack Pro 2055 scanner with ScanCat software to program it for the computer. When I program a trunk system into a separate bank, then scan it with the other banks, it only stays on the bank with the trunk system in it. It won't scan any other banks. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong, but that's why I joined your group to get help. Thank you so much for any help you can give me, Frank. All right, so it has been a while since I've used my Pro 2055, but it's a great radio. Uh, I've got mine buried here in the uh, in the cabinet, but it uh, doesn't mean I still can't answer your question. Now, again, my ScanCat software has, has disappeared, so I've lost my license for it, and I haven't been able to get it back. So, so what I use for my Pro 2055 is Butel software. Now, again, if, I have an affiliate link at scannerschool.com slash Butel. Now, Again, ScanCat, ScanCat Lite, or or Butel, I mean, it's all get the same job done. I just think that Butel does a much cleaner job at doing it. The ScanCat software to me was always a bit of a uh, Swiss Army knife. A very, very, uh, they tried to keep the same format. They tried to do a lot of scanners for it. And at the end, it just became too much in, in a piece of software, I think, for me to be comfortable using it. So that kind of really reaffirmed my love for uh, Butel at the time. But I think really what's happening right now, Frank, with your scanner is that the the 2055 not only has banks that you can program in, but it also has sub banks when it comes to the trunk system. So not only do you have like say 10 banks, main 10 main banks, you could take one of those 10 banks or all 10 of those 10 banks and make it a trunking bank. Now inside that trunking bank, you'll have 10 sub banks in there. So what ends up happening is when you're in trunk mode and you toggle the buttons on the keypad, you're not turning off the banks. You're turning off the sub banks in the trunk system. It's a headache. It's one of the biggest problems I had with scanning when I first got started with trunking. I couldn't figure it out. And every time I would sit there and I would accidentally knock out my trunk, my, my non-trunk banks, and we'd stuck with just a trunk system, I would have to plug the cable back in from the computer and reload the re- reload the software. And it was a headache until I realized, oh, I can just hit the trunk button and take the scanner out of trunk mode. And that would then open up the rest of the scanner for me to then go in there and get access to my rest of my banks. So that's one thing you could try is hit the trunk button, take the scanner out of trunk mode, and then you'll have access to the normal banks, not just the trunking bank of the scanner. Now, the second thing you can do is you can enter in a non-trunking frequency into your trunk bank. That's kind of a trick that I use, especially when programming scanners for somebody else. I just tell them that if they're in a trunk system, just to 
set the squelch all the way down until they hear the actual squelch. Then they can toggle that trunk system off and on. So again, the final thing you want to make sure too is that each frequency in that trunk system is labeled as a trunk site or a trunk transmitting uh, frequency. So I'm sure if you went through the, the manual or even if you went through ScanCat, you can flag that frequency as a trunking frequency. So you shouldn't have any issues with that with software. But I am betting that that's your issue, that you had a problem with uh toggling the other banks because you got stuck into the trunking sub bank it's happened to me a thousand times it frustrates the heck out of me which is why i'm really happy that the dma style of programming in unidin or the scan lists in whistler the radio shack line that uses the scan list and also the gre line as well as the new home patrol they don't use this bank sub bank anymore they go right into using just a list and everything is all part of the list and it just makes things a whole lot easier. So I think you'll get through it. If you have any other questions, Frank, be, just contact me and let me know. I did not answer this one, but I'm pretty sure that that is the issue and, and the solution to your problem. All right. So after this quick break, we'll uh, wrap it up with the last two questions. So Scanner School is sponsored by East Coast Pages. Now, East Coast Pages is one of my online companies, and we are a Unication Apollo, a Swiss phone dealer. If you're looking for a brand new Unication G2, G3, G4, G5, P2, and now again, returning DMR Type 1 and Type 2 pager, we've got you. You need an analog pager such as a Unication G1, a Swiss phone, or an Apollo, we got you there as well. Contact East Coast Pagers. Come to me directly, Phil, at eastcoastpagers.com, and I'll get you the best pricing out there on any pager hardware. Take me up on my word. We'll work on a price, and I'll get you the best price out there. Again, Phil at eastcoastpagers.com. All right, I want to welcome our newest sponsor to the podcast. National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your NatCom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of your America's Hobby Radio magazine as well as back issues too. Visit natcommag.com to download your free sample issue and sign up today. That's natcommag.com for National Communications Magazine. All right, before we wrap up, I want to also thank our continued Patreon supporters. Craig Harper, Dan, Glenn Bryden, Guy Lee, Irvin Thibodeau, James Felling, Jeff Block, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, M.T. Bono, Mark Beebe, Raymond Hill, Ronnie Bach, Sal Marandola, Scott Vorder, Signals Everywhere, Stephen Sheffield, Todd Glendie, and William Arcan. You can help support Scanner School for as little as $1 a month. If you pledge $3 a month, you'll receive the podcast earlier than the published date. And at the $5 per month level, you not only get the podcast early, but you also have access to a special monthly Q&A session and a set of squelchy stickers. Now, the $5 level is the best value tier, which helps bring us about a dollar a podcast episode or a dollar per week once Patreon fees are applied. Now, if Patreon isn't your thing and you want to help support Scanner School at no additional cost to you, you can help by using our affiliate links. We have affiliate links for Scanner Master, Amazon, and Butel Software. All links and also links to our Patreon are online at scannerschool.com slash support. All right, now on to the conclusion of this week's Ask Scanner School. All right, Chris Goodrow writes in, Hi, Phil. Thank you for the info you put up on the website. I am new to scanning, but have a unit in BCD 436 for a few years now. When I purchased it, I did so because of the zip code feature and the supposed ease to set up and use. Let me just say, you see the theme going on here with these radios? All right, back to the question. While I'm sure it's a lot easier, I've started to realize that the scanner still requires a lot of tweaking in order for it to work the best. I've been trying to learn, and your website and podcast is helpful. I'm in Oakland, California. We've had some fires around here that I'm sure you know. And with that in mind, I've been trying to learn how to better use my scanner, but I'm finding the learning curve is steep. Oakland PD uses a trunk P25 system, and there are a lot of hills here. I get more chatter on my phone's online app than from my scanner, and I always thought it was my physical location, which is hilly, but now I'm not so sure. 
I saw the new unit in handheld. I'm wondering if it makes sense for me to upgrade or if I have a perfectly great scanner already that I just don't know how to properly tune or for lack of better word. I know you said in one of your podcasts that BCD 436 is your go-to, so maybe it's just my user error. Ha. Huh. I do have a radio reference account and I've used the Sentinel software to update my scanner. I've tried creating favorites lists, but not sure how to access them once they're on the scanner. They are on there on the scanner, but when I press one or whatever, it doesn't work. Clearly, there are a ton of bells and whistles on this BCD, and I'd love to know how to effectively use them better. I see Udin has a great trading program, so I'm contemplating doing so to the upgrade, but maybe you don't think it's necessary. I see the Scanner Master has a program where they will program the SD card in my areas, which may make sense, but I don't know if they're a tweak the options to help coverage and clarity. I listened to your stomachist issue on the podcast, and I'm unsure if that's really the issue in my area. Mainly, I want the basics, but I want to know if I'm able to adjust the skin and maximize reception and not miss any calls. The tone out feature sounds interesting, but I have no idea where to begin with that. It seems like graduate scanner school stuff. Thanks again. So that's my story. Best, Chris. All right, Chris, great question. There's a lot of stuff in here. So let's go ahead and break down things real easy here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to jump on to the radio reference website. Now I'm going to go through this basically step by step with you. I, I, I'm opening up the system now. I'm looking at it really quick and I'm going to go through this whole thing live with you. So I'm in Alameda County right now, California, which is where I hope Oakland is. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm looking at the main page and there is basically everything is kind of broken off. It's this East Bay Regional Communications System. All right, so if you've listened to last month's Ask Scanner School, which is Session 102, again, scannerschool.com slash Session 102, Garrett Falwell actually asked a very, very similar question. He was also curious about monitoring this East Bay Regional Communications System, and it's the same system, it looks like, that you're looking to listen to as well. So I'm going to go through a lot of the same steps I went through with Garrett, but I'll, I'll go through them again with you again so we can kind of isolate through it. But the, the short story here was my suggestion to Garrett was, yeah, this, this would be a great solution for an SDS-100. So if, if that answers your question already, then that's great. But let me go through, the again, the, the hows and whys so that uh, if anybody didn't listen to last month's session, again, scannerschool.com slash session 102, then uh, you would kind of understand this as well. So again, I'm looking at the radio reference page here. And sheriffs, fire, EMS, basically hospitals, Oakland, which right, which is what you want to listen to. They're all in this this system called the East Bay Regional Communication System. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and click right into that. And the first thing I notice is we have let's see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight trunking sites, and there's a Southwest simulcast, an East simulcast, a West simulcast, a Northwest simulcast, a Central simulcast. And an east simulcast. Okay. Now, again, we also have a Crane Ridge and a Marsh Creek transmitter site as well. The trick here with these simulcast sites, let me just go ahead and click on, for example, I don't know what area really Oakland would be in here, but I'm just going to pick the southwest simulcast site. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Then I'm going to go ahead and click on an FCC site. And it will show me the transmitter locations. So it brings up a map when I can see the actual transmitter locations of all these transmitter sites. What happens is, is when you get the same transmitter site with simulcast, is the same transmitter site will transmit the exact same thing at the exact same time. And then what happens is that you end up with kind of a signal that's just slightly off timing. Uh, being received by the scanner. The best way to think about this is remember the old days. I mean, I don't know if maybe you would remember this, but uh, depending on your age, but when you used to watch uh, TV over analog TV over the the the, um, the antenna, and maybe sometimes you would get that ghosted image, right? You'd watch TV and you you maybe watch the news, and the anchor desk, the 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 you know the the reporter, he wouldn't really you wouldn't see him sharp, right? You kind of see him and then off just slightly to the to the top and to the right or whatever else. Right out of phase, you would see his image again. Think of that as simulcast, but in a digital level. Okay, the TV couldn't put the picture back together correctly. Right, neither can your scanner. All right, that's what's happening basically on a non IQ scanner. And what happens is the zeros and ones they don't line up. The scanner can't figure out its top from its bottom, and then it can't 
put things back together again. Humpty Dumpty can't be put back together again, basically. So that's what could be happening. Now, the, the thing you could try, first of all, is eliminating simulcasts, right? Don't use external antennas. Don't use gain. Try and put the uh, scanner where it only picks up one antenna, one one site. It's, it's a lot of different tricks that you could start playing with this one. And, and sometimes nine times out of 10, it could be an issue with that. You could be an issue too, where you're trying to listen to a county or a simulcast site where whatever it is you're trying to listen to isn't actually on there. Now, this is how we reuse frequencies now in a trunk system. So let's, for example, again, say we have a Southwest and East, a West and Northwest and a Central and an East, right? Let's just call them sites one, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's just make things easier here. For example... Oakland might be on site one, two, and three. When the, when they transmit up, right, there's units on sites one, two, and three. Not only are you dealing with simulcast, but you're also dealing with the, the same talk group going out on three sites. If your scanner is sitting there on site number four and Oakland PD isn't being broadcast on site four, you're never going to hear them. All right, it's, it's how the system reuses this thing. And basically what happens is if a radio isn't registered on there or a talk group isn't set up to be a wide area talk group, it's never going to be received on that site. All right. So again, you have to have the site in there that you want to be able to pick up. Now, again, is that how the other radios are set up on the system? I don't know. For example, here again, I've taken my TRX-1, my 325P2, my 436HP, and my SDS-100. I've taken them all out into a simulcast environment. The only radio that worked reliably was my SDS-100 and my Unication G5, okay? All the other unit and radios and the, and the whistle radio I had with me, they were deaf, right? The whistler one, it, it wouldn't pick up most of the transmission. The 325 was just as bad, and the 436 was, was better, but it wasn't great. Simulcast kills it, kills reception. So again, if you've got the means, if you've got the time, try up, up updating into the SDS 100. Okay. Now again, you've got a lot of stuff on here. Let's let's scroll down. Let's do a, a, a quick find and let's type in Oakland, and let's see what we come up with. So we have we have a bunch of EMS stuff in the county. And of course, you've got Oakland PD. They all have digital talk groups, which is great. It means they're not P25 phase two. They're still P25 phase one, which kind of gives me hope that maybe it's not such a bad issue with Solomoncast because I've, I've noticed it'd be a lot worse when you get the phase two stuff. So maybe it is a very simple setting in your scanner. No encryption that I could see on radio reference. Now, the other thing you try doing too is jumping into the radio reference forums and see if anybody else is having issues with their 436 and get maybe some local advice on that as well. Another thing you could try doing too is if you want to go the easy uh, or you want to go the cheap route is you could try looking at maybe purchasing a couple SDR dongles and playing around with those. And they work really well in a simulcast environment as well. But again, Simulcast is really the key here. That's really the the kind of the you know the wrench in the gears when it comes to things, and uh, it really is a pain in the neck to be honest with you. But at least we have radios out there now that are are able to kind of play around with this as well. So again, my advice to you really on on this: jump into local forums at reference. Come to scannerschool dot com, um, scannerschool dot club. Ask if there's a local guy there. Maybe uh, I could put you in, in in check with Garrett, and maybe the two of you can work it out together. That'd be really cool to do. And, and also, you know, you can jump on our Facebook group and see if anybody local to you is in the group as well that is uh, is working on the Oakland system. All right, so let's look at the rest of your question here as far as fire toneouts. Now, fire toneout is a really cool uh, little feature on it as well, and you have to be dedicated in fire toneout mode. Fire toneout mode only works in conventional mode, and it's either an off or an on state. You have to dedicate the scanner to be in fire tone out mode. If you don't know your fire tones, you can just set it up on your dispatch frequency and the scanner will actually decode them and you can commit them to memory. And then the next time that you have a call, the scanner will burp and chirp and uh, let you know what's going on on the frequency. As far as your favorites list, what, what you may want to start with doing first is just use the menu. That's what I do. I don't even bother with favorite lists, quick keys anymore because I end up with so many favorites lists in my scanner that assigning the keys and memorizing them to me is just too much of a headache. I just go right into set scan selections. I then go turn all favorites lists off. 
Then I can go and select favorites list and I scroll through it and just toggle them off and on one at a time. And those are the ones that it is that I want to listen to. So again, that is how I go through my favorites list on my scanner. And again, that's the way I recommend you start off with it as well is to go through things that way. So again, that's a great way to do it without having to mess with all of the favorites list. So hopefully I've answered the questions you've had here. And uh, I do apologize for the phone ringing in the background it is real life folks and uh things do happen here in uh in the office so again with that thank you so much for your question and let's get on to this week's only voicemail question hi phil this is guy i have a follow-up question from the last um ask Anna school session um we had put the database from the um dmr list the big dmr list so i'm trying to create a new favorites list and I'm having a difficulty putting it into the channels listing. I click on the append to favorites and then it goes in there and nothing really happens. So my question is, I'm wondering what I was doing wrong and if you can um, help me. Thank you. All right, Kai, thank you so much for the question. So we went through a couple of different things and for uh, the sake of the audience, I'm going to bring them up to speed. Basically what we talked about is um, on our one-to-one session is is we created a couple of favorites lists for a guy in Sentinel on on um, for his radio, and we did it two different ways. We we brought in from the database, the main database. We brought in some DMR that way, and we also went on to uh, digitalfrequencysearch.com. We found some DMR in his area. We did an export and we imported that information into Uden's Sentinel. So we're going to go through that whole process right here, really quick. And I understand it's it's an audio version of a, of a video thing but we're gonna go through it really quick this way if you guys want to follow at home you guys still can if you're listening in the car i'll kind of maybe you know just bookmark this part and go back to it so it's it's not gonna confuse you too much i don't think but uh, if it does i do apologize in advance for it so again pretty simple what you want to do is if you have sentinel open you're gonna go into the main database into usa you're gonna scroll down to your state so i'm going to play with new york because that's where i live I'm going to scroll down to Nassau County because, again, that is where I live. And, again, I'm going to click into County Systems. This is going to break down all of the trunk systems in the area. And if I go into Nassau County, again, it will break out the conventional stuff. So we, uh, as, as far as, as what uh, Guy and I talked about, we just loaded this all in almost as if it was conventional just to kind of get a feel for what was out there. So that's what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into, a, um, into Nassau County again, or just Nassau, and I'm going to click on the name. This will bring up on the right-hand side everything that's part of a department. So as far as the counties and everything else, municipalities, et cetera, et cetera. And I can start digging down into things. And really what I'm looking for is anything, again, for his case, that was DMR, right? And there really isn't much here that's going to help me out as far as DMR. I know I've got, um, say, a couple DPWs and whatnot. So I'm just going to grab really quick. I'm going to grab uh, Freeport, DPW, and Electric. So I've selected those two. I'm going to right-click. I'm going to append the favorites, which is, ex- again, exactly what Guy is, is up to and where he's stuck. So I'm going to click on New Favorites, It'd be to create a brand new favorites list, I'm going to just type in Freeport, for example, Freeport DPW, right? DPW DMR. And that's okay. It's going to create that new list. Now, if I want to come in here and maybe add in something else to this list, say I, I, I discovered that you know my local water company, which is true, South Farmingdale Water District, is also got a DMR, right? And again, I am not because they're trunking. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's just add them in here. So I'm going to go ahead and find them really quick. And I've got them here. And again, I'm going to right click on them. And I'm going to append the favorites list. I'm going to scroll down to where I get to Freeport DPW DMR and click on OK. Boom. The scanner software, Sentinel, did something. Really without prompting you, it did something. Okay. So it looks like nothing has happened at this point. When in reality, it did append it to the favorites list. If I scroll down to my editor on the left-hand side and scroll all the way into my personal favorites list, I will see on the Freeport DPW DMR that I do have South Farmingdale Water District has been added. Okay, It's been very simple. It's kind of been behind the scenes, but it has worked. All right. So let's also step this solution up just an extra notch here. What we're also going to do here is we are going to go to digitalfrequencysearch.com, which is exactly what we talked about. Because again, this this kind of changes things up just a little bit. 
And when the web page loads, which is really cool, I'm going to click on DMR search. Now, again, you could do P25 or NXDM search. I'm going to type in my county, again, which is Nassau, N-A-S-S-A-U, state, New York, which is N-Y. And I'm going to search or sort basically by entity. And I'm going to hit search. Now, this is going to bring up a web page. And this web page is now going to have basically a frequency, a type, an entity name, and, and all this other stuff that's related to these DMR frequencies. Okay. Now, I can actually export this information if I want to. How do I export this information? Glad you guys asked. So let's back it up just one bit. We're going to go back home. And what we're going to do is at the very top bar, there's going to be a button that says Quick Import. Let's go ahead and qu click on Quick Import. Again, county, I'm going to go ahead and hit Nassau. State is going to be New York. I'm going to click on the DMR button, and then I'm going to click on Sentinel and click on Search. Now, this in my area, this is going to bring 772 frequencies that are authorized just in my county alone for DMR. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the copy to clipboard button. And this copies all those frequencies in Sentinel format into my clipboard. I'm going to come back into my Sentinel. And I'm going to come into my DMR favorites list that I'm creating here. What I've got to do is I've got to go into the edit favorites list okay very important i go into my edit the favorites list so i'm going to right click on that and i'm going to go program favorites list after it loads up i'm going to go into the tree and i'm going to just for the heck of it i'm going to create a brand new subgroup or department or system name and i'm going to call that is DMR grab or DMR search, right? I'm just going to make that conventional for now. All right, just to see if we got any activity on here, right? And then I'm going to go into that DMR search and I'm going to click on the plus button again. Okay, this adds a department. Now again, I'm just going to do DMR search. All right, call it department nothing or DMR search, whatever it is you want to call it. It's just very important that you've got, you got the list, you've got the system, you've got the department. Once you get in the department again, you got to click on the green plus button. This is your channel. Okay. You want to click on that once. So you've got the channel name highlighted in blue. Then you can right click. You can paste. And with that, I now have 773 frequencies in my list. Okay. Because one and two are blank. So again, all right, not 173, but you get the idea. I'll take out the first two, relieve the first two. And, of course, the first one in the bank is a zero, so I have 771 total. And each one is a service type of custom one, so make sure you have that enabled. But that's how you quickly paste in from an external source into Sentinel. I told you guys over the an audio, over visual, or visual, over audio, this wouldn't be too bad. But if you haven't used Sentinel, yeah, I've, I've kind of lost you. But maybe if you have used Sentinel, it's, it's really not that daunting of a task to do this. So, again, Guy, I want to thank you so much for your question. And I also want to congratulate you, too, because since you're the only one this month to ask me a question using SpeakPipe or a local number, that means you automatically win another consulting call, which I'm happy for you because we had a lot of a lot of questions. I think you had maybe about a half a dozen questions that uh, that you asked me the last time we sat down and talked. And I know after we got off uh, the 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 call, you had a couple of the questions that you you realized you forgot to ask me. So we can go through this again, and uh, you know we can go through your other questions as well. So again, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask me for free, right? You can go to scannerschoolcom slash ask. Now, if you click on the speak pipe or you leave me a voicemail at five one six three zero eight two eight eight five. You will not only have your question pushed up to the top of the list, but you'll also be in the running for a free tutoring call. Now, again, these tutoring calls are the same calls I normally charge $47 for. And at that rate, you and I do a screen share for up to an hour, and I answer all the questions you may have about your scanning, from setting it up to programming your fares list, how to hook up your scanner to your computer. I have copy I've done topics like this with students in the past. So, again, you may ask your questions for free at scannerschool.com.ask, or you can book me for $47, scannerschool.com slash consulting. Now, again, you can check out all the session notes from this week at scannerschool.com slash session 107. Scanner School's copyright 2020. 
Montel Island Inc. And again, I'm Phil Lichtenberger, and this is Scanner School. We teach you everything that you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. We'll catch you all again next week. 73 of